Hi everyone, my name is Scott Carlson. I'm very sorry I couldn't be there with all of you, but I've just recently begun a position with Rice University in Houston as Metadata Coordinator, and I just couldn't make any schedule magic happen. But I'm quite glad to be able to participate, even if it is only electronically. I'd like to begin with a few nuggets of personal information. At the risk of giving away my age, I didn't get drawn to the Grateful Dead until around the middle of my high school experience. At that point, Jerry had been gone for a few years, which means that my entire Dead experience has been a love affair with trading live Dead shows via a network of other dedicated tapers and later on the vast reaches of the internet in accordance with the band's long-standing policies on the recording and distribution of their live shows. Meanwhile, my professional life as a librarian has expanded over the last couple of years to include work related to digital scholarship. Just this year, I completed a master's certificate in the stewardship of digital materials, and my new position is heavily involved with our institutional repository, which houses the university's collective intellectual output. Consequently, much of what I do is increasingly concerned about open access, which is the unlimited access to world knowledge and research, freely available thanks to a network of dedicated librarians, academics, and open access advocates across, well, the vast reaches of the internet. So with my time today, I would like to take a look at the points of intersection between open access and the Grateful Dead's taping policies. But first, two pieces of fair warning. First off, these two concepts aren't perfectly equivalent in either scope or motivation. But by examining the history of the Dead's taping policies, perhaps there will be something for open access evangelists to glean about their crusade. And secondly, I have chosen to take the route of basic introductions for both concepts. Consequently, some of those initial explanations may be redundant for a number of you, if not all of you. But for this discussion, I think it helps for all of us to start on the same page. At the very least, I will try not to be boring. I'd like to start with a very brief overview of the Dead's taping and trading policies. Monday of last week, October 27th, was the annual World Day for Audiovisual Heritage, a date set aside for raising worldwide awareness of the significance of recorded audiovisual documents and the preservation, preservation risks associated with them. Coincidentally, October 27, 2014, happened to be another anniversary of audiovisual heritage. It was the 30th anniversary of the establishment of the taping section at Grateful Dead concerts. Prior to 1984, as I'm sure all of you already know, Deadheads risked confiscation and ejection to surreptitiously record Grateful Dead conference Grateful Dead concerts using smuggled recording equipment hidden from the venue's security and the band's own crew. In the years leading up to the establishment of the taping section, the band's burgeoning success, along with the founding of Les Kipple's Taper Connecting Dead Relics magazine, resulted in the prol proliferation of Grateful Dead tape trading. Flagrant concert recording was eventually tolerated by the band, but not necessarily endorsed. Eventually, the constant presence of elevated microphones blocking sound engineer Dan Healy's view of the stage led to a suggestion, credited to Stephen Marcus, manager and co-founder of Grateful Dead Ticket Sales, to sell off the quote-unquote undesirable seats that resided behind Healy's soundboard as a taping section. So, beginning with the Berkeley Community Theater show on October 27, 1984, Dead taping was finally legit, complete with its own policy directly from the band. So long as no money changed hands, fans had free reign to swap their recorded shows. This time changed and technology eroded the distance between fans, and in some cases the distance between millions of fans at once. The taping policy evolved, but the core of the policy remains fairly similar even today. A uh, side note, for an, an analysis of the Grateful Dead's taping policy in the age of the internet, I would highly recommend an article written by my co-panelist, Jeremy Berg, published in Volume 36, Number 2 of the journal Popular Music and Society. At any rate, 
What started out as a way to keep a certain segment of the fan base happy accidentally became one of the most brilliant marketing tools in the history of the music industry. In the years since, numerous authors, academics, and marketing professionals have praised the taping policy as a stroke of genius. By becoming the first group to allow and eventually endorse audience recordings, each traded show was like an advertisement that attracted new fans. Despite the fact that people could essentially acquire their music for free, the Dead saw their fan base swell and found themselves playing larger and larger venues. It was such a boon for the band, the audience taping became something of an imperative for groups that followed in the Dead's footsteps, and it's now a common occurrence at many high-profile concerts and festivals. No wonder lyricist John Perry Barlow called the decision, quote, one of the most enlightened, practical, smart things that anybody ever did. But if I may, I would like to move us away from the concept of taping policies within a marketing context and talk about those decisions within the context of open access. At its most basic definition, open access is peer-reviewed scholarly research and literature that is digital, online, free of charge, and exempt of most licensing restrictions. The phrase open access predominantly covers scholarly journal articles, but as a librarian working with digital scholarship, I have seen the term come to cover a number of other publishing avenues, including theses, book chapters, research data, course materials, textbooks, and even entire journals. The foundation of the concept is the support of unrestricted access to up-to-date knowledge, itself considered a public good. Peter Suber, a former professor of philosophy and now a full-time advocate for open access, has traced the origins of the movement in the 1960s and the efforts that eventually produced the internet, email, and other, other governmental projects that aim to electronically network all kinds of research. However, the bulk of open access coalesced between 10 and 15 years ago, a period that encompassed a number of similar developments. These included the 1999 founding of the Open Archives Initiative, which developed the Protocol for Metadata Harvesting, which is a tool that aids in the dissemination of information on the Internet, the 2002 Budapest Open Access Initiative Statement, which gave the first concise definition of open access, and the 2003 Bethesda Statement on Open Access Publishing and the Berlin Declaration on Open Access to Knowledge in the Sciences and Humanities, both of which further clarified those definitions. The OA community continues to further define the parameters of open access and the issues it can be used to address. The most recent is the Lyon Declaration on Access to Information and Development, signed in August of this year, which aims to, quote, ensure that everyone has access to and is able to understand, use, and share the information that is necessary to promote sustainable development in democratic societies. So one would assume that Grateful Dead tape trading and open access would be, if nothing else, kiss and cousins at least. After all, they both seem to advocate access to some kind of material let loose by its creators. However, the concept of tape trading and recording is not a perfect analog to the larger goals of the open access movement. In fact, it isn't even an imperfect analog. While the proliferation and preservation of something as culturally significant as the live music of the Grateful Dead is unquestionably important, comparing its avail availability to something potentially along the lines of cutting-edge cancer research is a bit of an impractical comparison. The open access movement was as much about knowledge as a public good as it was a reaction to the monopolistic practices of modern academic publishing. Publishers, now aggregators, such as Elsevier, EBSCO, ProQuest, and JSTOR, have exploited their roles in the peer review and tenure processes, commanding exorbitant fees to access material that they had no hand in producing. This has allowed academic publishers to gradually raise the price of access to this material between 1986 and 2010 to a rate of four times higher than that of the U.S. inflation. It may have been hard at times for fans to get tickets to a Grateful Dead concert, but no one could ever accuse the band of exploiting their fans to such an extent just in exchange for access to their music. 
Furthermore, the central tenets of open access are not compatible with the DEDS taping policy. The shorthand definition of open access, coined by the Public Library of Science, summarily describes the dissatisfaction with price and permission barriers being imposed upon the proliferation of intellectual materials. The Grateful Dead's taping policy, shown here, however, gives fans no special privileges or permissions to do with their recordings as they please, for example, as if the recordings were licensed under a Creative Commons license, nor is there any expectation that just because fan recordings are freely accessible and tradable, so should the high-quality soundboard recordings released commercially by the band. In actuality, the Grateful Dead's taping pol policy effectively asserts the band's ultimate right to impose both of those barriers on their work, and it has ever since the policy was instituted. So, the question becomes, why compare the Dead's taping policies to open access if they are not a completely practical comparison. In reality, the finer differences of these two concepts effectively fade in light of the effect of the Grateful Dead's taping policies have had ultimately on the culture that bred the idea of open access. As I mentioned before, Peter Suber's timeline of open access activities ultimately traces its history to the beginnings of networked computer sharing, but technological progress does not advance in a vacuum. It is only in a world post-taping and trading policies do we get lengthy lists of artists that endorse taping and trading, uh, and also free re freely release their music, either in whole or in isolated tracks, for fan consumption and potential remixing. In the early 2000s, as open repository software began to proliferate and the open access philosophy began to cohere, the Internet Archive a nonprofit digital library with the stated mission of, quote, universal access to all knowledge, unquote, agreed to host a massive collection of dead shows on the, that the website eTree.org had collected, quote, with an attention to quality and completeness and at all times consistent with their understanding of the band's trading policy, unquote. As of this week, this week, the Internet Archive added to its growing list of freely available and downloadable literature and audiovisual material a library of over 900 arcade games from the 1970s through the 1990s. Call it a coincidence, or just call me speculative, but I have a hard time believing that open access wasn't just a little bit influenced by a culture where the Grateful Dead had told its fans, take it, you can have it. And there are still clear lessons about open access that can be learned from the institution of taping policies. One of the main lessons learned from the Grateful Dead taping policies goes back to the marketing context I mentioned earlier. Conventional wisdom would have us believe that by allowing fans to tape their concerts, the dead were essentially giving their product away for free. But business boomed instead of going bust. Similar fears naturally run rampant in the academic publishing world. Academic publishers don't have the merchandising or the album sales that the dead had to feed into their revenue streams and consequently they see open access as undermining their business model. How could a completely open access journal survive without some kind of revenue? Well, I'll let Barlow answer from his 1994 article in Wired, The Economy of Ideas. Quote, the fact is, no one but the Grateful Dead can perform a Grateful Dead song. So if you want the experience and not its thin projection, you have to buy a ticket from us. In other words, our intellectual property protection derives from our being the only real-time source of it. Thus, listening to a Grateful Dead tape is hardly the same experience as attending a Grateful Dead concert. The closer one can get to the headwaters of an informational stream, the better his chances of finding an accurate picture of reality in it." Unquote. What Barlow is describing of the dead is assuredly akin to, quote, value-added service, one of the many examples of sustainable open-access business models that can be found in the open-access directory maintained by Simmons College. The directory defines this concept as, quote, extra services on top of OA content, unquote, citing Open Edition, seen here, a French humanities and social sciences portal as its example. Open Edition's freemium model offers such extras as article alert services, 
unlimited and digital rights management free downloads, and, most importantly, participation in the portal's user committee working group. Also, one quick aside, it should not come as a surprise that the Electronic Frontier Foundation, a nonprofit organization co-founded by Barlow to defend digital civil liberties, considers open access one of its key issues. But back to Open Edition. Open Edition's utilization of a user committee as PERC speaks to another relevant point made by Barlow in Dennis McNally's book A Long Strange Trip. Quote, a lot of what we're selling is community. That is our main product. It's not music." Unquote. The added value of a Grateful Dead concert wasn't just the opportunity to walk away with freely available music if you hauled along your equipment. What some saw as a carnivalesque atmosphere was, to others, a community. McNally wrote, quote, The community was a collaboration between the fans and the dead, who gave the deadheads their name, symbols, and motifs to share such as the various logos and a commitment demonstrated by constant performing, outstanding sound, and the lowest possible ticket prices. Because the band dressed and acted like the audience, because there was no show, the audience correctly perceived them as people like themselves who just happened to be able to play, equal partners in that psychic quest." Unquote. In other words, the atmosphere that gave rise to taping policies was heavily dependent on a relationship between the band and the audience that was unlike any other in the pop music world. The Grateful Dead had broken down the traditional barrier separating the audience and the band, and in the process, cultivated the enthusiasm of their audience. In doing so, they ended up with a fervent audience that wanted to capture every single moment their group was together on stage, even if, by doing so, they were going against the traditional rules of attending concerts. Effectively, going against the norm ended up being greatly beneficial to both sides. I bring this up because at the moment, the open access community has a lot of active, strong voices, but nothing along the lines of the art and enthusiasm found in the deadhead community, and certainly not the uber dedication of the taper sect. It might be a bit much to ask for that kind of enthusiasm in the open access community, but at times that community might need that intense kind of ardor more than it needs another declaration of principles. Writing about the confusion of OA terminology, policy analyst David Wojcik opined that, quote, social movements often depend on grand sounding but poorly defined concepts. But, only a concept as poorly defined as the deadhead community could have taken an otherwise illicit activity and turned it into the cornerstone of culture surrounding that band. My ultimate hope is that the open access community eventually finds its own deadheads, and that they are as enthusiastic as the ones that changed our culture 30 years ago. Thank you, everyone, for listening to my presentation. Uh, again, I apologize that I couldn't be there, but I'm very, very happy that I could participate anyway. If you have any questions or comments, please do email me. My, my email is here on the screen, scarlson at rice.edu. I would love to partake in the discussion. Otherwise, I sincerely hope all of you enjoy have enjoyed yourselves at the conference and enjoy the rest of it. Uh, once again, thank you for listening, and have a wonderful rest of the conference.